it's uh, great to once again welcome back uh, Ken Yang uh, to the AA. Over the last few years, uh, we've been uh, fortunate to hear Ken on uh, a range of topics, many of them focusing on the uh, issue of the high-rise, uh, specifically uh, linked to aspects of ecology, sustainability, uh, the whole topic of bioclimatic structures. Uh, more recently, Ken has gone from the vertical to the horizontal and uh, has been working more systematically with structures that are really at ground or below ground uh, level. Uh, this investigation has resulted in a book uh, which is entitled Ground Scrapers and Subscrapers, uh, which has been uh, authored uh, by Iva Riches, Professor Iva Riches. Um, and um, in fact, this, we are also having the book launch uh, tonight and uh, Triangle Bookshop is going to be open uh, for an extended period so that at the end of this lecture Ken and Ivar are going to rush downstairs so that those of you who want to be uh, the first people to buy signed copies of this book uh, can do so. So it means that uh, we have to keep everything together and quite tight so that uh, Derek and his partners don't get uh, too, uh, too anxious uh, waiting down there for you, uh, for you to turn up. Um, I'm looking forward uh, to the lecture, but first I'd like to ask um, Iva Richards, the author of the book, to say a few words about the publication before uh, Ken speaks. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Motion. Um, there are, in fact, two books that Ken and I have produced in the last few months. The first one was called The Ecology of the Sky, and quite clearly that is a total synopsis of all of Ken's now very well-known uh, buildings which uh, are about the idea of the, of the tall structure and how that can be controlled and made into an ecologically sustainable thing. As has already been said, this book and Ken's lecture, which will expand on it, I'm sure, um, sets the record straight in that he has been doing um, low and often bury buildings um, for as long as the high buildings. And I think those begin with a small buried golf club facility in Kuala Lumpur in the 80s. And perhaps that is the forebearer of huge projects like the buried uh, My Street subscraper in Taipei, which is, a, I think, a phenomenal project and outstanding in this book. But what one sees again, as with the tall buildings, is an emergent set of very clear typologies. And I think that's the interesting thing, whether it's a big landscape plan, a corporate headquarters, there are forms which emerge that are a pattern and a language. And obviously what is underlying all this all the time is Ken's uh, sustainable agenda, which is absolutely encapsulated in his great book, The Green Skyscraper. So I'll say no more. Derek's staying out and late. Thanks, Ken. Oh, thank you. Um, well, thanks very much for the introduction, Ivor and Wilson. Um, well, I've been best known for um, our work on skyscrapers, and most people don't know that we do an awful lot of urban design work, low-rise and medium-rise buildings, and master plans. So after the uh, after the event in New York um, on September 11th, we were worried that there weren't going to be any more skyscraper work for us. <laughs> so this is our contingency plan, if you like. So um, today's talk will be about ground scrapers and subscrapers. And what I'd like to do is to um, discuss some of our ideas with you and, and how we try to interpret these um, by projects. Um, well, this is sort of like a quick diagram. We show the, the different typologies. Um, a skyscraper has been defined as a building which is over 10 stories because, um, well, it was originally defined as a building over 10 stories because uh, it was the highest that um, a fire engine ladder could reach in New York City. Of course, you know, today a fire engine ladder could reach much more than 10 stories, maybe 20, 30 stories. Well, that's a skyscraper. And a groundscape, obviously, is something that sits on the ground, 
and some subscape or something that sits below ground. What is important is the footprint it makes on the ground. To me, what's important the footprint it makes, because the skyscraper makes a very small footprint, and the, and the groundscraper makes a larger footprint, and obviously uh, the sub subscraper makes an excavated footprint, and this is the impact on the ground or the impact on the ecosystem. Now, architecture has um, significant impacts on, on, on the environment. It takes in huge amounts of energy and materials, it emits waste material, stores some of the waste. Um, by having a footprint in the ground, it interferes with the vegetation, um, affects the runoff, erosion, earthworks, gives of exhaust heat and fumes, affects the climatic um, ambient environment, and in some cases contaminates the groundwater. So these are some of the impacts on the environment, and that if we were to design ecologically, we have to be aware of the, the ecosystem in which we are working within. And so the first thing we do in our design is to try and understand the ecosystem in which we're working in, and to assess to what extent we can design with minimal impact, and more important, to find out to what extent we can design with positive impacts. This is a little, this is a sort of classification system I have for looking at sites. And uh, when I look at a site for the first time, I would ask, what sort of site is it? Is it an ecologically mature site, like a pristine pine forest? An ecologically immature site, like a partially devastated la land? Mixed artificial, like a park land, which is mixed with man-made and natural? Monoculture would be like a rice field or a corn field. And zero culture site would be like a site in the middle of New York where the, you know, the topsoil's gone, the fauna's gone, the flora's gone. The um, only thing that's probably left is the bedrock and the hydrology. And it, going up this table is increasing ecological complexity. And so uh, one of the things we have to do when we look at a site is to decide what sort of site it is, because that helps us determine the extent of ecological analysis we need to do for that site in order, in order to, to, to design with the ecosystem. So we need to extend, identify the extent of ecological analysis as the basis for our design. Um, here's an example of a project we worked on for a monoculture site. Um, it's an extension for the new campus for the University of Nottingham. This is the area view of the project. So site view basically is a series of link walkways. That's the Senate House administration. The teaching block is down here, and the uh, and the uh, accommodation down here, and this is the lake that goes underneath. This is sort of the water course that goes underneath to the lake below. Um, this is the cross section of the scheme, um, showing the canopy linkways. That's the administration building, and this is the um, the residence and the teaching at the urn. Um, here you are, you can see the administration in the middle the teaching, the main resource center, the lake down here, the staff residence, the students' residence, the green fingers that eats into the site, and the sports facilities at the far end, the main entrance that drop off, and that's the main road. This is the um, basic layout. So what happens is that you know the walkways are designed so that the maximum walking distance from the furthest point here to there that's about seven minutes. And this is the, uh, the canteen and the executive dining and the staff dining. These are the uh, students' housing, the faculty housing, Senate House administration, the resource center, the lecture halls, and the uh, faculties. And that's the sports facility at the end. Um, what we try to do is to have a covered canopy um, along the walkway so that you can walk from one facility to another facility without getting wet. And so by encouraging walking, we reduce the need to use cars and so encourage uh, low energy transportation. So the, um, the walking becomes the armature that sort of links everything together. And this is the sort of image of what the space underneath the canopy looks like. And uh, this is the thing that links the whole development together. Um, these are the lecture rooms down here. You can see the 
cross-section lecture rooms and a little canopy over it in between so that this keeps the space cool. And these are the three lecture rooms um, down here. Um, now, my contention is that for the first four categories, you have to analyze the site. Um, um, obviously, to a great extent, as you go upwards before you start designing. <coughs> obviously, you have to understand the ecosystem. Now, obviously, if, we, if an ecologist, then you realize that eco ecosystems are very complex things. There's a, complex, there's a complex interaction of physical constituents with the biological constituents, of interaction between climate, geology, soils, hydrological processes, with the animal and plant communities and the human communities in a very complex sort of way. Now, if you were to evaluate and study the ecosystem before you start designing, it's not something you can do in a week, in a month. You have to do it over seasons. You have to do it diurnally over the entire year. And so, obviously, if you were an architect practice, you have to do this. By the time you finish doing it, you've lost the job, or the archives give it to somebody else. So um, what landscape architects have started to sort of develop is what you call the layer cake method, where you see the site as a series of layers, geology, hydrology, of which, and you can map each of these layers. I call this a tentative method because I really don't like it, because it's not, it's not very thorough, and, and it's, but it is probably the best available system at the moment. Obviously, um, some, some landscape architects have been able to computerize it and, 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 and able to establish relationships between the factors. But it is a useful method developed by people like McHarg during the late 60s. And in, in fact, what you do is that you map the layers, establish ecological map, factor map, <coughs> map, put a grid over it, you assign points, and this is a detail one of those little squares. You can derive sensitivity uh, between the, the points. And you do what you call a composite ecological sensitivity map, which you could sometimes have several of these, which defines the, the carrying capacity of the site and the extent to which you can build onto the site. Here's an example of these maps, and that's an example of a composite map as a guide for design. So these, we did this for this project. So these are some of the maps we've done. Uh, we map the vegetation, slope analysis, um, the drainage, and so forth. And so if you like, um, this is the composite map. I can see that the design generally follows the, uh, you know, the red areas where we, could, we felt we could locate buildings. And we brought the water courses down underneath this building into the lake below. Um, we had, in this scheme, a, a series of ecological corridors which have continuous planting from one end of the side to the other end. And you can see the, the armature in between. And this is the Senate House, which is a low energy building. And um, now that's the, that's the first thing we do when we look at a site, which is to look at it as an ecosystem and try and identify to what extent we can build on it. It occurred to me around that time that uh, most architects or most planners um, define ecological design as designing with minimal impact on the environment. And I thought that's a terrible way of looking at ecological design because if you're designing minimal impacts, then it's a receding battle because it's a battle you never win. So I thought there must be some way we can design not with minimal impacts, with positive impacts on the environment. And so one of the ways of designing positively is, is, to, is to increase the biomass or, to, or to, to enhance biodiversity. And so I came across this idea of what I call the ecological connected landscape bridge. Now the idea is this. If you have two sites, site A and B, which are linked by this road, and it's sort of impervious in between, what happens if you build a bridge, a broad, massive bridge across it, just like this bridge over it, and you landscape it? And straight away, what you have is that you have improved the ecosystem interaction between the species, between one side of the site and the other, and therefore enhancing its uh, diversity, and encourages an increase in species diversity, and then generates a much more stable ecosystem. And so with this idea, I thought I uh, started to apply it to a series of projects. And, uh, this is a scheme we did for Paramato Road um, in Sydney. And you can see an example of landscape bridge over this 
nasty little road down here. So it really links, you know, both, you know, the fauna and flora and human species as well from one other side to the other. And well, it's, it's a sort of a fairly unpleasant road on, on the west side of Sydney. And we saw the road like a scar in a landscape. And we felt that you know, what we need to do is to stitch up the scar. And we call these sort of the road to be an exquisite scar. This is another part of the road where uh, we brought the landscape <coughs> across the road. This is the road down here across the landscape. And so these were some of the early studies we did. This was a proposal for Bishopsgate, um, the competition. And um, this is actually a competition site, which is green, which is the red dotted line. And we've actually brought the vegetation across to the opposite side, the joining sites. And um, this is the landscape pattern showing the, the vegetation over the site. Um, little black sort of shapes are the voids that let ventilation and daylight into the um, retail floors below. There's a detail of one of the bridges, um, and here, so one of the detailed bridges linking from our site. These are the towers on our site down to the adjoining site. What we wanted to do was to have continuous vegetation that grows from the ground plane, works its way up to the top of the building, so that the landscape village is not just horizontally, but vertically as well. So, um, harking back to a scheme that we did in 1985, building with IBM, where we had um, a patch of green here and stepped all the way up, you know, a series of step planters. And so this was an experiment we did nearly 15 years ago. It was all right as an idea because until you know we realized halfway up the building, we ran, ran out of the building. So we, we, we brought the planting across that floor, and we told the client to free that floor from, the, from any office use. We called the plant floor. We brought the plants across, but we also put the air conditioning plant there, so we, you know, the client thought it was justifiable. And then it went around the corner and up to the other side of the site, so it so really zigzags one end of the site down to the other end. Um, and so, in fact, it's a series of planters with trellises. We brought the planting all the way up. And the planter had a um, gravity-fed uh, sprinkler system that feeds water and fertilizer into the planter boxes. And so it, you know, it became almost like a living organism. So with this project, what we had was a continuous planting going all the way up. And to achieve this, we had a, a floor plate which looks like this, where where the, the passageway to the apartment units is in fact a ramp, and on the inside of the ramp are the planted boxes, and so you can see the planted boxes on the inside of the ramp working its way up, and occasionally will just shoot up and become part of a sky core and go back in again. And so that was the idea for the scheme. And um, going back again, 1985, we did a tower in Kuala Lumpur, which is the Bowser Tower, and here we had edge planting. And when, it, when this was completed, it was, it was called the Harriest Building in the World. Um, these are some summary of some of the things we learned from putting vegetation in buildings. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but essentially what we need to do is to choose, um, select um, non-ornamental species and non-flowering species, or those species which are very hardy, because you find them on the roadsides and, and, and on hedges, and these are the ones that survive over the hot and cold seasons and the mid-seasons. So what we don't want is the vegetation that die in the winter or in the summer. Now, there are a lot of skeptics about roof gardens, so I'm putting this in to show that um, you know, there are proprietary systems of roof gardens, and this is one that's produced by CalZip, and so you know, um, you can, they're actually standard roof gardens which you, can, which you can install at the drop of a hat. Now, planting standards. The World Health Organization you know, recommends about 25 square meters of greenery per resident. So if we you know, see office standards as about the gross flow area of 130 square meters per person, then the standards are equivalent to about 20% of your gross flow area should be given to vegetation. General town planning standards is 10% of site area, and so that's equivalent to 10% of gross flow area. So ideally, we should try and get a one-to-one, -one. of course, you're going to be hard-pressed to get a client to agree to this, but uh, we should get you know, over 100% of the gross flow area given to organic mass if we can. 
So that's, that's why you know, ecological design is a bit of an uphill battle. And half the time you have to persuade clients, tell them to put the greenery in because it's, it's good for the building, it's good for the environment, <coughs> good for the Our scheme in, in, um, in Alphen Castle basically uh, had vegetation. But with London, which is at 52 degrees above the equator, the sun is mostly on the south. And so um, what we had was basically south-facing greenery and very little on the north side. Um, these are some of the sky courts. And this is the floor plate of the building. You can see the, um, <coughs> the ramp walkway on the inside. And these are the terraces. I'm sorry, this is not a, sky, this is not a ground scraper, but this just illustrates the, the idea of putting planting buildings. And what we had with this scheme is um, an air gap here between the walkway and the apartment units. And we had shutters here so that the mid-seasons we can use natural ventilation to try and keep the whole core area cool and, and to try and encourage cross-ventilation. And in winter, we can actually sort of seal off this to keep the wind coming in and to keep the heat in. And this shows the responses over different times of the year. And so from the link bridge idea, we said, um, we thought then, if that's a good thing to do, then all master plans should really ha be ecologically linked. And so this was a scheme we designed in Huanan in Guangzhou in China. And um, the site has a series of existing knolls, the little hillets which we had to, wanted to keep. So there's no excavation at all of these hills. That's the waterfront. That's the sort of major motorway going across. And these two patches are land that doesn't belong to our client. <coughs> and so um, with this master plan, these are the location of the bridges at these spots. And so in effect, you can, the vegetation can go from one part of the site, or the species can flow to the other part of the site down to the other. In fact, you can basically walk from one end of the site to the other end of the site without ever crossing a road. Um, these are some of the ecological analysis we did of the vegetation. Um, this is the topography of views. Um, this is the land suitable development. Um, we've got a feng shui master to do the analysis as well. And uh, he insisted he got paid as a percentage. Um, and this is the land use zoning. Um, that's the, the greening pattern. Um, and that's the detail of one of the uh, bridges. Here you are, you can see the road underneath and the landscape bridge that goes over from one hill to the other hill. Um, well, if you like, it's a series of layers. So layer one would be the light rapid transit track. Layer two is the pedestrian route. Layer three is the landscape bridge, and layer four is the, um, is the road below, and that's the waterfront down here. That's the view, and the, and the waterfront, you know, the highway is raised above the water, you know, the ed waterfront edge, so the landscape actually extends underneath the highway, going up to the waterfront as well. So you really have continuous vegetation going all the way down, and that's one of the hillocks or knolls on the side, and that yellow is the light rapid transit system comes across the site. Now, then I thought, all buildings are fundamentally inorganic. And so architecture can actually positively contribute to the environment by increasing its biomass. And so with this scheme, uh, what we tried to do was to have, well, this is sort of, you know, one of those cutaway type this is the cladding, that's the, we had a sort of vegetation system inside the building that starts from the ground going all the way up, and that's the cladding to the building, that's the structure. And so um, this is the building, you can see the vegetation, we well, can see in a minute, uh, going from the inside right to the roof. And the back is the factory building, and uh, this is the headquarters of the, the office building part of the of development. You see, most of our existing buildings are basically inorganic. And, but where are the organic components? I mean, take a building like this. The only thing that's organic is you and me and the bugs. 
But in nature, you have a full balance of inorganic and organic. So that means we've been designing fundamentally wrong, wrong things. We're designing mostly inorganic things. And, and if, you, if you see the ecosystem consisting of a balance of physical and biological constituents working together as a whole, then the uh, missing constituents are the uh, biological constituents. And so if you ask me what green design is, then green design at its most fundamental level is basically bringing greenery and vegetation back into the environment and to balance it and to try and, if you like, um, create a mimetic urban ecosystem. So, I mean, if you read all these books and all these articles that you see in journals about architects who lay claim to, uh, to design ecological buildings, you have to ask them, you know, where is the ecological component? Where are the biological constituents? They're basically assembly of hardware. So um, then I started to think about different ways we could put green in buildings. Um, well, this is a map of Manhattan. You can put it you know, on one location, as Tommy says, just like that. Yeah. Or you can disperse it, like you see in London with a series of squares. Or you can just use the fingers, and which eats into the city. <coughs> the skyscraper, again, you can just put it on one location, or you can have a spotty relationship here, or you have an integrated relationship. Obviously, these two are, are preferred because the, um, you know, the vegetation is linked, the, um, the species, are, 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 you know, the movements are, are facilitated, and genders are much more diverse ecosystem. Being diverse, it's much more stable. Being much more stable, it requires less maintenance and, and higher survivability rate. And so with this scheme, um, what, you have is, what you have is this stretch of green that works its way up on the inside of the building. So within this structure, um, this is what, ha what you see on the inside. You can see a little cafe at the bottom. And you can see the planting working its way up right to the roof. And these are the staircases going all the way up. So if then the next stage is to make it a little bit more complex and to try and create what I call mimetic of an ecosystem. So not just, you should not just balance the greenery, but also to, to try and interact the organic and the inorganic in such a way that they actually become a, a, a man-made ecosystem. Um, <coughs> now, so I thought, Basically, what we're doing is designing prosthetic devices. A prosthetic device is like an artificial limb. You, know, you connect the inorganic system, this artificial leg, with the organic system, and you try and make it interface in as, um, as interactive way as possible. So essentially, um, that's what we're doing, designing prosthetic devices. But if you look at the limb, this is all right. It's easy to design this because it's only need to integrate mechanically. But, you know, the, probably the most sophisticated you know, system we have is probably the artificial heart. But if you look at the most sophisticated artificial heart, the energy source is still external. You still need batteries. You know, we haven't been able to use a design an uh, artificial heart that <coughs> uses the body as a source of energy. And the survivability rate is pretty low, about 70%. And so, if, you know, if, even if we can, if, you know, with these sophisticated devices, you know, we've still got a long way before we can design a truly effective building as a prosthetic device, which is integrating something inorganic, man-made, with a natural, which is a natural environment. Now, ecosystems have a number of properties. Some of the properties they have is recycling. And so, if, you know, if you look at the flow of materials in a building, from production to construction to consumption, we should try to close the loop as much as possible. So if you like this little model in which you need to design to, you know, to design, to reuse, recycle, and ultimately to try and reintegrate back to the, uh, to back into the environment. Because you know, things have to go some way. Nothing is lost uh, in this environment. We cannot, you know, we can just say we cannot say that the waste has to go somewhere. We have to find out where the waste goes, where where exactly the waste goes, because that's what ecological design is about. And so one of the ideas we had is what we call the green cell, in which we uh, cut cells in the building, cut little voids, 
And with a cell, we bring in a number of things. Uh, with the cells, we can bring in daylight into the inner part of the building. It collects in rainwater, which is a recycle. Um, we can we bring in vegetation from the roof all the way down. Um, it brings in natural ventilation to the inner parts of the building. And kind of algae sort of uh, recycling um, for the sewage. And so uh, with this development, what we have is a series of green cells that patches through the development that goes all the way down is four or five floors. And so uh, we have a series of green cells cast into the development, you can see. Um, and then on top of it, we, we landscape it so you have this ecological corridor that extends all the way down to the park at the other end. Um, just a cross section through it. So um, um, these are the towers, and you can see parking below and the green cells you know, through it. That's another view of it. And so um, the building actually is like, if you call it a, a landscape sandwich, because there's a series of layers of vegetation with, with sort of, you know, with retail in between. So building feel like it's almost like an underground building. It's, it's, it's an underground building with, with, uh, with uh, the landscape above and on, at all levels um, as a sort of Dagwood type sandwich. Um, this is a scheme for a, for a subscraper. I thought I'd show this because um, this is an idea we had uh, for an urban design project in Taiwan. Um, the project was for the theatre district in Taipei, and it's at Irmay <coughs> Street. And um, and so we started looking at the street, and we found that you know they had complex ownerships of different buildings. So, and the only two lots we could do something with were these two vacant lots. So then we thought, well, how could we do something with the street with this project? So the only thing we found which had a single owner was the street itself. The street belonged to the authorities, it belonged to the government. So we said, well, why don't we pedestrianize the street, dug up the street, and made that into the retail, made that into the link that link all these two sites together. So, so the street became potentially developable land, and, and, we, you know, and this became the link between these two lots. And so we had retail dug into the ground. And so we should pedestrianize the whole street. Um, here's a cross section from one end of the street to the other. Here's a model of the scheme. You can see the vacant lot on this side, the vacant lot on the other side, and the street that has been landscaped. And this is a cross section through here. And these two blocks are the buildings here. And this is the river, and we go underneath the river to a little so ventilator at the other end. So we have different levels of excavation down the streets, so up to about four or five levels. That's sort of um, future development. So you can see the street you know, along this way. And this is the street itself. And you can see this part. There's this part. You can see the air wells that we cut into the voids below to bring in ventilation and daylight into the lower parts of the floor. These are the different levels. That's B1, B2, B3, and B4 and B5. And this is sort of, that's uh, pathway perspective. And so we, we talked about greening buildings, greening the site, bringing vegetation in. How about the design of the building itself? The component of the building that really uses high energy is, are its operational systems, the mechanical and electrical systems. I call these the operational systems. And Again, I classify these into a series of modes. Um, I call them passive mode, mixed mode, full mode, and productive mode. And for those of you who are a little bit confused by looking at some of the uh, projects that you see in the magazines, you know, some architects having double skin walls and full walls, you could be easily misled into thinking, ah, this is what ecological design is all about. I contend that there are four basic modes. And um, of course, there's increasing technology as you go down you know, from the top to the bottom. And I propose that we should optimize each of these modes before we go to the next one. We should optimize all the passive mode strategies before we go to the mixed mode. 
useful mode and if you have the budget for productive mode. Passive mode means, passive mode is basically biochromatic design. Improve conflict conditions without the use of any electromechanical systems. I hope you understand that because I'm going to repeat it again. Passive mode is improve conflict conditions without the use of any electromechanical system. And you should optimize all these options first before you can look at what are the mixed mode options for that particular, particular locality. And different localities you have, you know, because of its climatic differences and latitudes, you can, you know, you can, you can only use different types of mixed mode options. You cannot use, for instance, evaporative cooling in the tropics because it's, you know, it's high humidity. And so there are certain systems you can use, systems you can't. And then having optimized all the passive modes, mixed mode is some electromechanical devices, and full mode will be full m &E systems, air conditioning, heating, air change control, humidity control, and, and a whole lot. And, and productive mode is where you start to generate your own energy productively, either through photovoltaics or through um, wind energy or solar collectors. And so we need to optimize the operation modes step by step before we leap into select the, the operation, you know, the, uh, the one that we, we, we're going to use uh, for the full mode. Because if you don't, you start to make decisions and mistakes that you may have to correct earlier on. So, oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, well, this is a scheme that we designed um, for competition in, in, uh, in Geneva. Um, this is the existing uh, WIPO building. WIPO is World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, I think Gunter Benish, I think, got the, got the project. The idea was to do an extension to the World WIPO, and, um, and this was our design. And we, we had photovoltaics all over the facade, um, as integrated with the glass. Uh, part of the requirements was to give a, a right of way from this side to the other side, so that explains a drop of canopy down here. Um, this is looking at from that. I don't know if you know, those, you know, if you know Geneva, because at this corner is that Freedom Square, which is that huge chair designed by Klaus Oldenburg, um, and um, that's the main entrance. And this is the existing building built in the 50s. That's the ground floor plan. So the existing building is down here, down here, this curved bit, and we had to give right, right away down here. Main entrance is here, and here we have a ramp that goes all the way up the tower. Up the block. Um, that's the entrance. You can see, looking right through, we can see the trees and the lower ice buildings on the other side. And these are the different modes at different times of year for winter um, and summer and in the mid seasons. We try and extend the, the mid season as long as possible to try and have natural ventilation um, for the spaces. Now, why do I suggest that we should optimize the passive modes for the mixed modes, full mode, and productive mode? Because now, if all these systems fail, if let's say that's a brownout, or you know, in 50 years' time we run out of fossil fuels, that it's been designed to accommodate passive mode, then it will still remain comfortable. So the build system remains comfortable if these systems fail, and that's that's something you know that that there are very few people appreciate because. So in this way, it is so important to understand the biochromatic approach, uh, biochromatic modes, options for a particular locality, and optimize all those options first before you go to these. Because otherwise, if you start from full mode, it fails, and that's it. The remain the building is, is you know, it will, will be incredibly hot in the summer, and very cold in the winter, and very ineffective during the mid seasons. Now. Quantitatively, this is what it means. Um, a full mode building would probably use anything between 220 to maybe 350, 400 cold hours per square meter per annum. Mixed mode would be between 80 to about 160, and passive mode would be between maybe about 40 to 60 cold hours per square meter per annum. The building research establishment in the UK recommends good practice for offices in the UK to try and achieve about 100 cold hours per square meter per annum. So these are some targets. Um, graphically, this is what it means. Now, what you have here is the UK is the cold winter and hot summer. So, if you like, the dotted line represents the environmental conditions on the outside. Now, with passive mode, in other words, without any electromechanical systems, through the strategies, the biochemical strategies, you can improve the conditions in winter a little bit 
in the summer, a little bit less cold in the winter, less hot in the summer. Now take for instance, let's say if you improve the insulation of your building, where you make all the walls and windows airtight, then obviously without use of any electromechanical devices, you keep the heat in. In summer, you shade it and you have good cross ventilation, then you're just a little bit more comfortable. Maximum means some electromechanical devices. Again, you can improve it a little bit, improve it a little bit in the summer. Now, if you insist on full air conditioning control, full heating control, consistent temperature, air change humidity throughout the whole year, then what you have is a full mode situation like this, which is, you know, going back to the, the, the um, histogram earlier on, it's a full high energy situation. And so, what this diagram informs us is that. <coughs> Low energy design, which is part of ecological design, is a lifestyle issue. In other words, if, if, you know, if, if you're prepared to accept a little bit cold in the winter, a little bit hot in the summer, then you're starting to head towards a low energy condition. You know, if you wear warm clothes in winter and sleep around starkers in summer, you know, you, uh, you, you, you're heading towards a passive mode. Now, Many books have been written about passive mode. O.J. Brothers, um, Baruch Giovanni, my friend Jane Drew, so I'm not going to go into this in great detail. But these are some of the strategies that you can adopt in designing and optimizing all these strategies, shaping the building correctly, orienting it properly, for facade design and so forth, before you start um, you know, as part of your design process. One of the reasons for doing this is because uh, if you look at the life cycle of a building, over 70% of its energy use is an operational phase. And so if you can save energy during the operational phase, you're heading towards the lower energy consumption um, in, the, um, in the life cycle of the building. Um, this is a high-rise building, a 16-story building, but I'm putting this in to illustrate the passive mode strategies we've adopted. These are some of the passive mode strategies we've adopted. Um, this is the sun path, and we use the, um, by shaping the building, we're putting the cores in the right location. It acts as a buffer between the inside and the outside. Um, this shows the OGTV value for different core positions. You know, this is the core to the, to this side, core to the center, core to the north. This is 43.3, 47.5, and 47.6. So what it means is that, you know, at the design stage, just by shaping and orientating the building, you're heading towards low energy building. Otherwise, you have to correct decisions that you've made by having much more intensive mechanical electric systems. Then it makes total nonsense of designing a low energy building. And so it's so important to repeat, as I can repeat this again, to optimize all passive modes before you go into your mixed modes and your full modes. Um, well, this is what we, one of the passive modes we use is um, shading to the facade. This is the main entrance, that's the reception. This is the air gap. This part is, you know, has some mounted ground surface, or mounted ground roof. The tower begins here, going all the way up. There's a swimming pool on the top. That's the changing room. And the executive dining is down here. Here's a gentleman trying to jump off the side of the building. <laughs> and he meant now he's going to hit the sun shades. Um, so these are, these are the sun shades of the building. And that's the forecourt below and the uh, main entrance, um, reception down there, and, <laughs> and there's the canopy below. And uh, says the little girl, don't do this at home, it's frightfully dangerous. So that's some of the passive mode strategies. But um, at the same time, while we're trying to design, we're also experimenting with different um, different ways of, uh, 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 of, of, of devising passive mode systems and mixed mode systems. And one of the things we started to work with is what we call the wing wall. Essentially, if, when the wind A hits the facade, the wind enters a small A, and the orifice is X. So as you know, most times the wind would hit the facade in an incline, and the wind enters a B. And because of the incline, you have lots of energy here. A is bigger than B. Now, you put a little wing wall here, then what you do is you capture the whole this whole sector win. And then when it comes to C, and C is bigger than P and A. And so what we thought, well, that's a great idea. Let's have two wing walls and have sliding shutters to control the wind coming in and we capture this sector win. Um, for this scheme, what we did was to have um, two, um, 
two wing walls and, and, and a balcony here as a wind pocket collected. And so this is looking at it from this side. And we said, if we're going to have a wing wall, we must well, you know, have a meal out of it and make it into a mast. And you can see the wind pockets in between. That's a piece of the wing wall. That's a typical floor plate. And there's the wind pocket here. I can see the two wing walls and these little shutters. And this is looking at from this side. So you can see the sliding shutters in the top. And this is the balustrade to stop people falling over. Now, don't forget this is built in Penang. So, you know, Malaysia is not exactly first world in, well, it's not third world either. I call it two and a half world. So, I mean, this was built in Tokyo or in, in New York. You would probably be, you know, or, or London would be, you have sp horizontal spoilers. We, we think it would be more automated. So this is a very rough prototype, so, you know, the idea of the wing wall. These are CFD analysis of the building. And, you know, you can see the wind hitting the facade and tailing off. So, collects the facade. In, in plan, you can see the wind accumulating in the wind pocket here. And then, um, now this is a situation where the, wind is, the windows are shut. You can see the heat accumulating in the middle and some you know, interesting hot spots here. And this hot spot that was told later on was due to an error now designed for the sun shades. Then, as you can see, we start to open the wing walls and uh, the shutters here. You can see the wind whooshing across between this wing wall and wing wall here. The pocket, you can see the wind coming in and the wind moving across. And so, what we have here is the beginning of a natural ventilator building, skyscraper. Um, this experimental graph that we prepared, you know, wind speeds below here, meters per second, potential for size is open from zero to 100%. And this is the air change. So, we started to plot these graphs. <coughs> with Dr. Phil Jones at the University of Cardiff and uh, for South Facade, North Facade, and East Facade. And so, for instance, the wind on that day is blowing at 6 meters per second. It hits on the East Facade. That's the percentage of the windows, about 60% of the East Facade as we open, because this air change. And so, if you can imagine this graph being plotted for every facade, for every time of the day, every day in the year, and linked to a wind anometer and automated system, and you have the beginning of a natural ventilated um, building. So um, then I had a discussion with um, another expert in wind, Dick Ainsley. And Dick says, well, what we need to do is put a wing wall in the middle that we capture this whole sector of wind. So obviously it was too late for this building, so we had to try it out for another project. So with this new scheme, what we did was to put the um, the wind pockets, again, at these two points. And you can see the wing wall here and the wing wall here and the shutters in between. And so you can see the wing wall and the shutters in between. So having designed this, then another sort of friend of mine, Professor Richard Hyde, says, well, you have, I have too deep a floor plan. I don't get enough daylight, natural light into the floor plate. It's too deep a floor plate. So we started to look into the possibility of using light pipes um, and we did the physics, he did the physics for this, and he, we conclude that if you have a light pipe of about a meter wide and not 20 meters deep with a reflective surface, we can get, you can throw light into at least 12 meters inside the building and get 400 lux, which is pretty good um, in the tropics. So that's the detail of the uh, wing wall down here, and the light pipes are, you know, dug into the floors. Another idea we had was to have a canopy, which is like a service canopy, like an open and shut. And also, you can have mixed mode devices suspended from it. This is a scheme that we designed for Kuala Lumpur for a parcel site called Bukit Bintang. And the idea was to, um, to put in sort of mixed users and try and make it turn the back streets into the front street, if you like, and make the buildings double facade. And phase one was this area where we had a design a huge canopy. Um, here you are, you can see the canopy going across. This is just Bukit Bintang, the main entrance down here. The existing federal hotel is here. You can see a huge canopy that cuts across to the other building at the other end. We have sort of, you know, voice cut through the roof and ventilates in between. This is what it looks like at night. You can see the space with the canopy on top. Um, very lively space. The canopy facing the facade. 
the back. You can see the air gaps in between and from the mixed mode devices along this passageway. This is the main entrance. And uh, this one looks at night. Um, green courts. This was our scheme for, um, for the Singapore National Library. This was our composition drawings. Essentially what we had is two blocks, what we call the series block and the fun block. This is where you have put the collections, and this is the multimedia section. And we freed the plaza as a, as a sort of open to the sky space. Um, the client rather liked it because he said this reminded them of the Singapore void deck and the housing blocks. And so um, here you are, the, you know, this is the collections. That's the, um, that's the multimedia block, and it's linked by bridges. There's a floor plate um, of the original scheme. Um, that's the multimeter block and the collections block. Um, we worked with Mary Jane Wilson, um, Sandy Wilson's wife, helped us with the library um, configura internal configurations, and, uh, and also the, the engineers would be a helpful. That's the detail of the atrium. So this was the competition scheme. And you can see, uh, oops, uh, that's the uh, collections. The plaza at a lower level, um, the core on the southwest side, um, the uh, multimeter block, the atrium in between, and the main entrance canopy down here, um, the auditorium and the sky cross on top, and the, soft, the shaded roof. Well, these were some of the uh, passive mode strategies we adopted. Um, shaking the building, solar protection, making use of wind. So we, you know, we create voids in the building so that that's the wind could flow through to help cool the um, heat. Um, at the competition stage, we actually simulated in the wind tunnel, and that's our little building, green building down here. This is the surrounding buildings, and this is the mapping of the comfort conditions at the plaza, <coughs> uh, and this is the 3D graphic impression of the comfort conditions. And the prickly points are where the hot spots are. That's the energy pie. Um, we worked out that the building uses about 170 kilodollars per square meter per annum compared to the typical office building, which uses about 230. And don't forget, the library is switched off 24 hours and the air conditioning is switched off. This was the, um, after we won it, we started to develop the scheme. This was the developed scheme. Um, some changes started to take place, and you can see, um, try to look at different ways of structuring the top floor and the lower floors. And, uh, but we still, we still kept the atrium and the, and the other block. Um, this is the final scheme that is being built now. It started work on site October last year. And, um, it's got more sort of organic looking. Um, we had a sort of louvered roof. The client wanted to have a viewing pod. Again, we kept the atrium. And the ground floor, again, is also, uh, you know, it has to remain a, a, a void deck. And you can see the sort of space in between. And this is the, uh, this is the multimedia block and the collection block on this side. Now, I'm going to end in a minute, and I want to talk a little bit about the ecological debate because there's so much confusion of what ecological design is, and there are so many what I call self professed experts around. And um, I think the ecological debate is between, on the one hand, designers who regard ecological buildings as assembly of gadgets. In other words, if you put, you know, some people who think that you put solar collectors, double skin walls, you know, you do the body energy studies, and you, and you, you know, have a couple of recycling systems, and and that's ecological architecture. Versus the other lot who sees uh, ecological building as ecosystems. Well, I'm afraid I belong to this lot, so uh, I'm very distressed by some of these, you know, what I see in the publications. Uh, I mean, there are fundamental differences. People see buildings as gadgets, start with technology. 
this type of breed determines specifications and objectives, versus efficiency, production, mechanistic and artificial. Whereas if you start as an ecologist, you know, you, you, you have this on ecology, and it starts with the sediment, what is there, what is the ecosystem, there's a process of systemic integration that goes symbiosis, it's organic, holistic, and it's natural. So, what we need to do is try and sort of bridge the two. Ecological design is trying to design the interface between the organic system and the memory system, or the, the eco-prosthetic system, I call it. Something that is a, a prosthetic device, because it's man-made, and somehow you have to integrate it in, in systemically with the organic system, the natural environment. And that's the biggest challenge confronting ecological design today. And so I hope this will sort of clear up a lot of the air of what ecological design is. And, 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 and don't be misled when you see all these sort of fancy schemes in, in magazines and books where, you know, architect uses a double skin wall or a flu atrium or, or whatever. But you should ask them, where's the greenery? Where's the green bits? You know, where's the interface with the natural environment? That's, you know, probably this is the absolute, what is missing. So another question I get asked all the time is, what is the ecological aesthetic? How do you, why do you shape the buildings the way you do? And how do you, why do you draw and design a certain way? Well, I'm not sure how to answer this, except to say that, you know, we started in our early years with a fairly mechanistic sort of view of architecture. Um, it became a little bit more organic. That's often castle. This is a scheme that we designed in uh, Singapore. Uh, this is the uh, Limcott Wing School in Cyberjaya, which should start on site soon. This is the uh, TechLink uh, complex in Cyberjaya again. Um, this, are two this is another project we're doing in Cyberjaya, which is much organic. And the other end of the scale would be systemic. You know, in other words, it doesn't matter how much it looks like pro provided systemically it integrates with the environment. And so, is this, you know, the I think the direction to go is really more process orientated. We should focus on how the building integrates with the environment as an eco-prosthetic system and, and how it looks maybe less important, but how it works, I think, is probably um, the crux to the whole thing. Yeah, but so, yeah, yeah. so maybe there's time for a, just really a few questions before we go down to the bookshop downstairs. No, I think that that's uh, who would like to uh, to start? Maybe those people who have to leave, they'll leave quickly. while people are moving, I could ask one sure. quick question. It's because you were obviously playing between the new sort of ground scrapers and subscrapers and the previous examples of the skyscrapers. And it seems, of course, that with the skyscrapers, there is a sort of limit to do with the size of the building, that it's, it's a high rise. And all the ecological or bioclimatic uh, operations have to happen within the framework of the, of the artifice, of the built work. Whereas with the, with the ground scrapers and, and subscrapers, you have, of course, a closer proximity to the natural condition of what you were saying with the organic, with the ground, with the earth, and also with the, um, with the larger territory of the city itself. Um, it seems that within the current projects still, um, because of the limitations of the competitions and so on, you're working within the limited boundary of the site. So still, the greening or the organics relationship to the inorganic is happening within the site boundary. Um, have you started developing research which really looks at the ground scrapers within the larger territory of the city where uh, actually these investigations also result in, for example, urban or landscape propositions for the city, which actually turn the city 
into an ecological project. So it doesn't have to be necessarily the single building that's doing it, but it's more the relationship between the urban condition and the kinds of buildings that happen. In other words, a different approach than the one of the skyscrapers. I think so. I've never thought about it from that point of view, but um, I think we should not look at a project as an object, mm. but really sort of citywide. But you know, now that you mention it, I think it what, you know generates ideas of the studies we should do, you know, of, of you know, the relationship relationship between built form and um, and, uh, and the vegetation. Uh, and I have a friend who's doing um, work in which. Um, he uses infrared mapping, satellite mapping of, of, the, uh, of the city, and he uses what he called uh, LAI, which is Leaf Area Index, as an indication of the, uh, of the uh, health of the ecosystem. So I think that's also, you know, looking at the macro level, I think it's an interesting way of looking at, at eco design as well. You know, that's a great idea, thank you. <laughs> Do you have a, can you take the microphone from behind you? Yeah, I'll speak loud. Yes, but the people in the back can't hear you, unless you're going to scream. I'm not fine. Take it, just behind. Just behind, just behind. I'm just interested in, um, I'm interested in the fact that you said the way we're designing in the West for ecologically sound buildings is wrong in terms of we're using too much mechanistic architecture and triple skins. And I was wondering whether you can get away with not doing that because you're in a, working in a different climate. I'd also like you to comment on um, whether you think anyone's doing it right in the West or even in England, and who the best engineers are. Well, Ben will answer the last one. It makes more enemies than friends. Um, I think. Have you noticed why you know um, the more people living you know in the northern hemispheres because you know, the temperate climates, especially near the Mediterranean areas, uh, are much more comfortable for the whole year. And so, you know, a certain parts of the world, um, the, uh, the biochromatic systems, are, you know, the, the passive mode systems are, are much more uh, salubrious and, and you require less, uh, less mechanical systems. I mean, you know, until maybe the last 10, 20 years, people didn't use to air condition office buildings in the UK. So you know, it's only that lifestyle sort of imposes uh, um, its, its um, standards on people. People, you know, then start to have air conditioned systems. So um, certain climates in the world, certain systems can work. So, for instance, um, Baruch Giovanni, who's my big hero, if you really go and read this book, um, and his, his books are packed with ideas. Whenever I'm, you know, I, I'm. I'm I'm, I'm at my wit's end, I would look at his books and, and I could get new ideas. He, you know, I, I got the idea of the wind wall from his book um, and um, the evaporative cooling. He, his, he must be in his late, early 70s now. Same generation as the OJ brothers. But he didn't, he didn't get the same recognition that the OJ brothers got. And he's still alive as an emeritus professor at University of Seattle, UCLA in California. He's a very generous man, he gives his ideas freely. And I think he's probably one of the few experts uh, in this world. Um, I've always doubted whether evaporative cooling could work in the tropics because of the high humidity level. But he tells me it can be done. But you have to experiment with it. And he thinks that if you have, uh, he believes that if you use um, uh, swimming pool rooftops or water filled rooftops, and if you seal it, if you insulate it in, in the daytime, the temperature of the water will cool the concrete structure, and through um, cooling pipes, you can actually um, use uh, the coolness of the water to cool the inside of the building. And I, I, I'm in fact still working on that now for a house. So I think Baruch Giovanni is the, is the, is the, is the person that we should try and. Um, you know, it's a mine of ideas. Engineers, I think um, most of the engineering companies in this country are, are good. Um, <laughs> people like I, I tend to work with Bethel McCarthy more because he's got a better sense of humor. <laughs> um, you know, Atelier line, I think, are good. Arabs, of course, and you know, you know Ridby and Bird. So, I mean, there are a number of very good firms here. Um, 
I'm not sure that asks you a question. I just asked if anyone's doing right in England. Oh, and I think they're over in England. Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry to say that. Um, I mean, Feldman Clegg, I think, is a good firm. I mean, you know, they are interesting. But he's not an ecologist, that's the trouble. You know, uh, most, uh, most architects don't have a background in ecology. I know that um, Bernard Chumi, I think, is starting a um, ecologically um, directed sort of, you know, I think he calls it ecological philosophy to architecture. I think. If you look at the curriculum of Columbia, I think you know, they're looking to that. The number of schools of architecture in the world who are trying to teach ecological design to students. So um, I think there are a number of people who do, do very good work. I mean, in the US, I mean, like Rocky Mountain, I think, you know, it's a good organization. Uh, so there's a, I'm here. Yes, sir. <laughs> there's a, a question about when you speak about the systemic architecture or uh, like a, a getting a symbiosis between building and then the, the environment surrounding him. I mean, I think about the, an interface we have to certain way uh, design between the, the biotic and the abiotic components. And normally, uh, the characteristic of the biotic components that they have a, an evolution in the time that is quite fast uh, compared to the one of the abiotic system. So I think that you, if you have to design these uh, symbiotic systems, you have to, in a certain way, be able to manage this interface in, in the design process. So yes. how do you normally deal with these uh, time variables in, in managing the interaction with in the time? Well, that's what uh, conservation is about. You know, um, before, you know, we always talk about conservation in terms of, you know, conservation of buildings. But for many years, you know, uh, people have practiced um, forestry, people have practiced um, ecological conservation. Um, obviously, nature is less predictable than you know, the mechanical systems. And so, you know, you have to, you have to de you know, develop methods to c control the, not so, the word is not e evolution, the word is ecological succession. So ecosystems uh, um, change over time. And, and they reach a sort of peak, what they call, you know, of succession. And um, so what you want to do, if you want to maintain it in a certain state, you know, and, and rather and not let it reach succession, then you have to practice some, some form of ecological conservation. So there are many techniques for doing this. And uh, in fact, people in the forestry uh, 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 discipline have been practicing for many years. It's like tendering your garden, really. So, yeah. Maybe that could be the last question. So. Yes, sir. Can you get them? Uh, Yes, uh, obviously, your uh, buildings are driven by uh, ecological efficiency and not cost efficiency. I'm really curious as to how you deal with financial institutions to get you know, your experience of building. Financial institutions. <laughs> Money talks for bullshit walks. Well, um, yes, well, you see, I have to sort of, you know, as a practicing architect, then you have to see the project as a practicing architect. And as a practicing architect, um, money is the most important thing. And so um, when I meet a client for the first time, I said, if you appoint me as an architect, having appointed me as an architect, your money now becomes my money because I have to look at it uh, as careful with it. You know, I have to look at the money, uh, your money, with as much care as I would look at, look at look after my own money. Um, you see, most architects, uh, when they get a project, they will leap off into design straight away. They would back up the envelopes, doing thumbnail sketches, and start producing models and schemes. Um, I don't really do that because uh, until I have a good design brief, in other words, uh, your net areas, your gross areas, schedule of car parking, and so forth, and then from there, I would establish a cost plan before I start designing. And this has to be approved by the client. The client has to approve the areas and the cost plan, and that areas and cross areas, and sometimes the general configuration of the building. It sounds a bit restrictive, but it is very important to get that, for me, to get that approved by the client. If it's a commercial client, then I would do the financials for him. In other words, I don't do a very sophisticated cash flow analysis, I just do a sort of uh, 
on a two-page, um, what a state agents call a residue analysis. You look at the income, development costs, the rentable costs, and, and, and you, you deduct one from the other was residue is your profit. If he makes 25% profit, then that's good. So I would do this, the financial analysis for the client, and I showed it to the client, and I said, this is, this, this is what you want. Are you happy with the uh, profit? Are you happy with the marketing prices? Are you happy with the construction budget? So, uh, so having, you know, sometimes we have to reiterate this two or three times and, uh, before we get a kind of proof. And um, if you look into the book that uh, Professor Ivorich has mentioned called Ecology of the Sky, and you look at the Amna project, Amna Tower, I've actually reproduced the first financial feasibility study I did for the client in that book. And so with that, we, we said, you know, having the, cli having, approved, having the client approve of the financials, then we designed to that. We designed to the budget, we designed to the areas, we designed to the efficiency they expect. And so when we present the scheme to the client, we tell them that, you know, it already meets your uh, net area requirements, um, you've costed it, and you don't believe me, the quantity surveyor is here to prove it. And um, then in addition, these are the marketing features that makes your scheme marketable. Because at the end of the day, if the client cannot market the scheme, they cannot get it read, then no matter how beautiful the design is, you know, it's, it's not going to get built. So if it's not a commercial project, then if it's uh, less an institution project, we just have to design to budget. Mm. Now those by design to budget means you have to be, be expert in value engineering. You have to know how much a door costs, and you have to, you know, you know, how, you know, you have to work within the client's budget. And you have to be clever with use of materials. And so, so you know, if the client feels confident that you're designing to the budget, he tends to let you be a little bit more liberal with the architecture. So this way, we try and design within the budget, and, we say, and I always say to the client, look, you know, it meets all your requirements. You're going to make your profitability anyway. But between you and me, I'm the only one who's trained to do architecture. So why don't you let me do that? <laughs> so um, that's what I do most times with the client. Um, maybe this is a good moment to, because this is, I think, the right audience related to the question that you were asking, to uh, let you know that the AA is actually in the process of uh, taking over Hook Park in uh, Dorset, which is a 350-acre estate with a series of buildings by Fryotto, ABK, and, uh, and Ted Cullinan. And for a long time, these buildings and the massive workshops were used also for the development of wood thinnings in relation to the building industry to actually try and develop new kinds of ecologically sustainable buildings. And this will, in fact, give DAA a lot of possibilities, not just in terms of working with wood um, structures, but other forms of, of uh, explorations that are precisely going to deal with uh, the aspect of sustainability, ecology, and, and research, uh, which uh, are based on kind of fabrications and making things by the students, which in some way, since he forgot to mention it, will, will in a sense supplement or, or, or complement the research interest of the um, environment and energy program in the graduate school that, uh, that is obviously trying to also deal with, uh, with some of the concerns that I know. Um, Ken and Hamza and Yang um, have, uh, have in their work. So in any case, I want to thank Ken for, for uh, his provocative talk and invite all of you to, uh, to rush down to uh, the Triangle Bookshop and get him to sign a copy of uh, Brown Scrapers, Subscrapers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but I'll go on the first floor. Are you going to that?